This is our last talk for the session, Rocco Gangel speaking about Pierce's existential graphs. So go. Great, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks so much to the organizers pulling together this, uh, this great conference. Um, like many of the talks that, that we've heard, this is a collaborative work. Um, I'm a philosopher. Gianluca Caterina is a mathematician. Fernando Tomei is an economist. Um, and we've been working together for over a decade on a kind of interdisciplinary program in diagrammatic logic, game theory, and philosophy of science. And one of the things that we have found to be very helpful about category theory is that it's a formal framework that allows for interdisciplinary work to, uh, to happen. And so maybe this will be um, something of an example of this. Um, so the talk today is on the existential graphs of, of Charles Peirce, basically three parts. To summarize the graphs, um, the alpha level very quickly, um, and then get to this reconstruction of the EG alpha logic notation um, using these generic figures. Um, and then at the very end, sketch out um, quite briefly how this approach can be extended to the beta graphs. So this is Charles Peirce. Um, He's a great philosopher and polymath, uh, as well as a scientist. And we're focused here on his system of logical notation uh, that he called the existential graphs that he worked on um, in the, the last couple decades of the 19th century and continued to fiddle with uh, until his death uh, just before World War I. So the existential graphs um, have three levels, uh, the alpha level, correspond to classical propositional logic, the beta level to um, what we now think of as first order logic with equality, and then the gamma level, which he never finalized um, in, a, in a complete form. Um, there are various models for it. Um, he was trying to uh, generate what we now see as modal logics and also higher order logics. And we won't talk about those at all uh, in this talk. Um, so we're focused basically on the alpha graphs. Uh, and the alpha graphs are a wonderful iconic uh, notation for propositional logic. And this is a kind of um, quasi BNR um, uh, system for constructing the class of, of graphs. So there's a blank sheet, which we call the sheet of assertion. And that is a graph. Um, we draw or scribe closed curves on the sheet and a, a cut with nothing in it, we call it the empty cut. That's a graph. Uh, we have variable letters, each one of those is a graph. And then we basically have two rules. If alpha and beta are graphs, then we can juxtapose those on the sheet. This corresponds to logical conjunction. So this graph would say A and B. Um, and of course, uh, because we're working in this uh, kind of topological framework, commutivity is built in. A and B can be written anywhere on the sheet, anywhere on the same area, um, and they have the same status. Um, and then finally, if, if gamma is a graph, we can draw a closed curve around that graph and that represents logical. Uh, okay. Sorry? So that bottom, bottom graph would represent the claim not A and B. Um, and so the first thing to note is by nesting these cuts, we divide the sheet into even and odd areas. And the sheet of assertion itself is considered even. Um, and this allows us to formulate uh, two of the inference rules. And think of these as rules that allow you to transform a given graph, um, permissions to either write or erase that correspond to um, valid logical inferences. As you can see, these are written in ordinary language. And one of the tasks that we'd like to um, tackle is making mathematically precise and also perspicuous um, how these um, rules actually work. And just to give you a, a visual picture, rather than working through the details of each, of each rule, we basically have four kinds of rule. And there's some interesting symmetries built into this system. On any odd area of a graph, you can write an arbitrary graph. So here, the, um, the graph Q has been written on an odd area. Q doesn't need to be just a letter. It could be an arbitrary graph. Um, in a kind of dual way, you can erase a subgraph from any even area. So here we can erase the Q. Um, you can iterate a graph onto any um, area that is lower than 
the area that it's on. Um, and just the picture here of the idea, you can take this Q and iterate it to either of these uh, areas below it in a certain sense. And you also can go the other way. If you have a system like this, you can de-iterate those subgraphs, sort of pull them out. And then you have a double cut write erase rule. If you have two cuts with nothing in between them, you can erase those anywhere on the sheet. And you can also draw them around an arbitrary subgraph. And just to give you a sense of how this works in terms of a logical derivation, the graph here on the lower left um, states P, and then it negates the conjunction P and not Q. Well, not P and not Q is equivalent to P implies Q. So we have P and P implies Q. From this, we can deiterate the P. We then erase the double cut and then erase even the P. And so we derive Q. So from P and P implies Q, we derive Q. And this system of rules is um, sound and complete for uh, classical propositional logic. Um, so what I want to indicate here is a, a sort of interesting um, piece of the semantics that will become important when we get to the categorical reconstruction is a way in which the syntax and the semantics of Peirce's systems um, are more closely integrated, I think, than in um, what we think of as standard logic. So um, if we have a, an alphabet of variables, right, classical way of thinking of evaluation is we just map this to true and false. That's what we're doing here, but we think of false as being the empty cut and true as the empty sheet for reasons that'll be apparent in a second. Um, so now let's take the, um, the set of all well-formed alpha graphs, call it uh, EG sub alpha, and now we'll denote EG alpha star to be the subcollection of graphs that have no variables. We call them cuts only graphs. They look like these here. And now we take our valuation function that evaluates all the variables to either true or false. And we're going to extend it in a natural way to a function from EG alpha to EG alpha star. So what does this extension look like? Well, if we have this graph, um, which we can interpret as A and B or C. Well, if we take the valuation that um, evaluates A to the empty cut or false, B to the cut or false, and C to the sheet or true, you'll see that our V of G just substitutes those subgraphs for the variables. Um, and so this gives us a cuts only graph for any uh, well-formed uh, alpha graph. Um, and interestingly enough, we can then apply these two rules um, in a subsequent function to reduce any cuts only graph to either the empty cut or the empty sheet. If we have anywhere we have a double cut, we erase it. Anywhere we have two cuts on the same area, we, uh, in a sense, collapse them to one or erase one. And these are, uh, in terms of purse, delete, double cut, and de-iterate, or de-iterating a, a cut. Um, and these correspond to Spencer, George Spencer Brown's initials in his laws of form. Um, and it's easy to show that this, this reduction algorithm, as we call it, um, will take any finite cuts only graph to um, the, the empty cut or the empty sheet in a way that preserves its logical value, right? That's the, the clutch. So to give you an example, we take our same cuts only graph that we just saw that evaluated A, B, and C. Well, we apply rule one twice. We delete this double cut that leaves us with a new double cut, we delete that, and then we're stuck with a cut that we can't delete. Um, and that means that the evaluation, the V hat of that graph is false. All right, so then how does this um, get plugged into category theory? Um, there have been a few different projects. Um, Brady and Trimble in a pair of articles um, in 2000, um, worked with both alpha and beta in, in two very, very excellent papers. Uh, I would encourage you to go and, and take a look at them. Very, very recently, like just within the last couple of weeks, I believe, Hayden and Sobachinsky um, uh, published a very, very nice paper expressing beta uh, in terms of string diagrams and Frobenius algebras. Um, our approach is quite different. It's more kind of meat and potatoes category theory. We're using the generic figures approach um, from the book by Reyes, Reyes, and Zolfagari. Uh, and um, uh, that's kind of what I want to show you here is how that applies to these graphs. So most of you are probably familiar with this object, even if you don't call it a generic figure. 
Uh, if you're not familiar with this, it's probably not going to help to try to explain it. Uh, but basically, a generic figure is the object A of a small category C. And then we call the representable set, and that's their language. I think in current terminology, people usually call it a representable functor. H of A is just the pre sheaf um, that goes from C op into set um, that basically takes uh, each object into the home set of its arrows that go into A, right? And then there's a kind of uh, uh, map on morphisms in terms of precomposition. And if that's overly confusing to some of you, don't worry, we'll see a picture of what that means. Um, but the reason we define these generic figures is that we can then have uh, A figures of any pre sheaf in the functor category set to the C op. So what we call A figures of an arbitrary pre sheaf C op into set are just natural transformations, H A into X. So what we're going to do is build a category e.g. alpha star um, that represents these cuts only graphs. So our base category uh, are just is basically n with the standard ordering. Um, and then e.g. alpha star is just the category of pre sheaves from a op into finite sets. The objects are functors, the morphisms are natural transformations. Um, and we'll work with a couple of kind of work a day restrictions. Uh, we'll presume that um, these uh, cuts only graphs truncate at some point, have some uh, la uh, final depth to them. And in general, in the category, we'll work with just monic morphisms to keep things uh, tidy. So what do these things look like? What's nice about this approach, we can actually picture these structures. Well, on the one hand, we can think of them as cuts only graphs, just systems of nested circles. We can move around in the plane, um, or we can see them as forests. Um, and what are the generic figures? Well, say H of A3 is just going to be three nested cuts, um, or think of it as a chain of three nodes as a forest. Uh, but then the nice um, result, or uh, sort of an immediate result, is that natural transformations, the A, A sub N figures, um, the maps from, say, H A5 into an arbitrary graph, are the cuts at depth, in this case, five, or in the representation as a forest, the nodes at depth five. Uh, and then we have uh, a nice commutative triangle uh, if we have the situation where uh, M is less than N, and then we have uh, two natural transformations, mu and nu, that go into a, a forest or a graph uh, F, then we know that the circle, the cut nu, is inside the cut mu or the corresponding structure in terms of the forest, or in the um, mu would be in the initial segment. So here's the main idea. Um, we can take a cuts only graph um, and articulate its structure exhaustively in terms of these generic figures, as well as the ways that they uh, interact with each other. Um, in almost the same terms, we can think of these things as sub-objects of an arbitrary graph G. So morphisms of G into omega, because EG alpha star is a topos. And indeed, the sub-object classifier is a graph. It just happens to be an infinite graph that has an interesting kind of fractal structure that you, uh, that you can actually see if you had a, an image of it. So very quickly here, the, the strategy um, in terms of modeling the alpha graph system is to characterize the transformation rules and the semantic reduction algorithm for cuts-only graphs only, just arbitrary uh, nested circles, and then introduce graphs with variables as morphisms in this category, e.g. alpha star, and then extend the cuts only characterization to these graphs with variables. Uh, I'll go very quickly for the, through the first bullet point and focus on the second one, because it's, it's pretty straightforward, and then think about how it goes um, in the direction of beta. So um, once we have this architecture of e.g. alpha star, it's quite straightforward. Kind of elementary category theory um, to define operations like negation. Uh, it's a functor from EG alpha star uh, into itself that basically takes a graph and draws a cut around it. Um, we have a, an operation given um, a subgraph G prime on an area A of a graph G, which can be specified in terms of these generic figures. We can uh, take the graph that erases G prime from that area. And we can write 
an arbitrary graph G prime once we pick an area A on a given graph G. We get this interesting uh, kind of push out. Um, and that gives us a way then to rewrite the transformation rules in a quasi algebraic way, um, given these operations um, that can cash out in terms of something mathematically precise uh, in terms of the generic figures in the, the three sheaf category. Um, but uh, the focus here is this um, sort of straightforward technique of um, adding variables in. So what we're going to do is take these cuts only graphs and we're going to build what we call G plus, which is just going to be a monic morphism from our cuts only graph G into this new thing G hat. So the, the graph with variables will be the G plus. So let's see what we can do with our old friend A and B or C. The first thing we do is we take its cut only skeleton. We just remove the variables and that's our G. We take that as this kind of minimal uh, state and think of that as the valuation when A, B and C are all true. Um, and then we replace the variables with variable spots or marks. Um, and then we just replace each of those marks with the empty cut. We think of this as evaluating each variable to false. Um, and then we have an inclusion of G into this new G hat. Um, and uh, the very nice kind of simple straightforward result is we then have in the semantics, a model of G plus, a model of our variable uh, graph with variables is just any cuts only graph such that this diagram commutes. We have the morphism G into G hat. And then if we have an M G plus such that, such that this commutes, we have a model the function v hat, which reduces to the empty cut or the empty sheet, takes care of the rest. Now, if you've been paying attention, you should be troubled by the fact that there might very well be multiple tokens of a single variable type, right? We might have x appearing in two different spots, two different areas um, in the, the graph. And the short answer is that we construct a groupoid on these variable marks. Uh, and then we require that the uh, m uh, g plus uh, uh, collection factor through this groupoid. And for the details, I'd encourage you to take a look at the paper, which is there on the ACT 2020 uh, website. Um, so then very quickly to conclude, um, can this approach using these generic figures be extended to EG beta? The answer is yes, at least syntactically. Now beta has the same structure as alpha, but it introduces a new convention, the line of identity. Um, and this allows us to, um, uh, surprisingly, get all the richness of first order logic with equality. Um, and without going into the rules or the details here, this top um, graph, if you think of the line of identity as an existential quantifier, think of a relation here like gives as a ternary relation. In this case, someone uh, gives somebody something um, in terms of the structure of the relation. This graph where the cuts are negations uh, would say very informally, Someone who is not a poet gives nothing to somebody. Um, and of course, these things can um, become quite complex. And we're going to perform, in some sense, the opposite operation um, to what we did with alpha. Instead of going to cuts only, we're going to remove the cuts. So we're going to deal with graphs like the bottom one, which says someone is a poet and gives something to somebody. Uh, so if we get rid of all the cuts, we simplify our problem, um, and we can build these things in terms of a pre sheaf category. So our base category, which we call B star, um, can be described like this, but a diagram is worth a thousand symbols. The base category can be pictured like this. You basically have generic figures as lines of identity. You have tokens of relations of arbitrary arity, one, two, three, four, and so forth. Um, you always have as many arrows going from L into that relation as um, the arity, and then we have these types that allow us to distinguish, for example, the binary relation loves from the binary relation kills. So um, pre sheaves um, over B star, so the category um, uh, fin set to the B star, we call e.g. beta star, and these objects, these functors, correspond to um, beta graphs without cuts. And we just introduced this one condition because we don't, it would be strange to have infinitely many um, arities of every arity, 
where we want to kind of cap the arity of the relation in a given graph at some point. And that, that's just kind of a technical thing. And this is essentially a syntax um, for what many of you are probably familiar with as regular logic. Um, and you can do some interesting things, define a symmetric monoidal category on these structures. Um, but um, we just want to end then with the, the question, uh, well, what about the negation? Can we build the negation, the cuts back in? Um, and the answer is yes, at least syntactically. Um, and the basic idea is to paste a copy of B star to each of the objects of uh, A, and then add these new soldering point objects linking the copies of B star um, in order to accommodate lines of identity that go across the cuts. Uh, and just to end with a kind of picture of what this looks like, um, you have this base category. So you can see we have our original cuts only category of A's, right? and it can it extends indefinitely to the, to the right. And then we have our B star copy here that corresponds to the sheet of assertion, here that corresponds to depth uh, cuts of depth one, cuts of depth two, and so forth. You notice that there are these new objects that solder together lines of identity that go across these cuts. And then there's only a single collection of the types because we want the types to range over relations uh, in anywhere in the graph at any uh, uh, arbitrary nesting. So that's it. Thanks very much. Um, and look forward to especially hearing from any suggestions that you have. I know that there are a lot of fancy um, uh, gadgets out there. Um, and I think it would be wonderful to, to learn um, more about how we could build this kind of meat and potatoes structure smoothly into some of the more uh, fancy, uh, fancy things. But yeah, thanks, thanks again. Great, thanks very much. Are there any questions? So I guess since this is the last talk of the day, people can keep talking <laughs> until the until the boss gets tired, which is like David or someone. Any questions, anybody? Just fire away, I guess. Or comments. Yes, Todd, go ahead. You have to unmute yourself if you're no, I don't know what he's doing. Todd's gesticulating wildly, but okay. He might be muted. be able to do it now. Sorry about that. Is that possible? Okay. There we go. That, that, I was trying to say I can't. Okay, it looked like you're drowning, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Rocco. That was very nice. Um, uh, unfortunately, it, while you were giving your talk, uh, I was multitasking and writing something in chat, and I think I missed if you could go back a few pages to the category, the, the site for generic figures for the beta. Uh, you have to go back a little further, I think. Uh, I, I, this is the uh, cut free. Uh, yeah, this, this is the beta, beta star. This is the, the formal yeah, description. Yeah, okay, yeah, right. Uh, uh, could, could you walk me through that just one more time, please? Yeah. Well, and it's uh, it's hard to just it's hard to say. I guess like it's it's easier to, working with this example and just the, the indices are sort of given. The uh -huh. idea is we have we have three kinds of object, and that's like the uh, here. So the objects um, are L and then a bunch of RIs and a bunch of TIs indexed by, by the natural numbers, right? Um, on the graph, right? And, and because we don't have any cuts, right? We're, we're gonna have, we're assuming everything is finite. Um, we're gonna have a finite number of lines of identity. Um, and then we're going to have tokens, um, say, I mean, I, maybe the easiest thing is to, to work with a binary relation here. So let's say we have um, a graph that says, um, maybe I can even draw it. Like the, I was impressed that the other um, might be asking too much of me. Annotate. 
No, uh, I, I, th I think I'm getting it. Uh, the, the notation looks kind of suggestive here. So. Yeah, so if we say, you know, um, maybe we have a, a graph, something loves something and what? something kills something and these two things are the same. So something loves something that is killed by something else. Mm -hmm. Then we, what we would do is we would have two, the, um, uh, the fiber over our R2 is going to be uh, two because we have two binary relations, tokens, but then each of those is gonna be taken into um, some element of our set of binary relation types, which might we may say we have you know a zillion binary relation types, but but in principle they could be the same, right? We could have two L's here, and then they would both go um, to that type, uh, yeah. and then the lines of identity are just going to ensure that in this case we have a set of three elements. We're going to take um, we 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 really the, these these should be indexed. I guess that would be the, the these. Um, arrows, you know, one of them is going to be um, the, the first argument place of the binary relation. The other one is going to be the second argument place. And I think that that's done in the previous slide. Um, but that, in any case, that's the way, that, that's the idea. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to study that. Um, it's nice that you're using generic figures to formalize the syntax here. So, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I've seen that done before, but very nice. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so um, thanks very much. I think that concludes our session. And there is an applied category theory pub, which of course Bob Kirka knows the location of.